Oh my god, I've just got first light on this new QHY200M. Dylan from the Byron Bay Observatory here. How are you? It's been a while. It's good to see you. You're looking well. How is your astrophotography going in? How is your hot cousin? Does she ask about me? Does she ask? It's planetary season and I love planetary season, but you know what bugs me about it? Is that I spend my whole year leveling up the deep space stuff. I'm taking photos of galaxies and nebula and faint exotic targets. And then all of a sudden, all of my learning, all of my upgrading, all of my stuff, it just goes out the window because planetary is a whole different ball game. Taking photos of planets is a completely different set of acquisition, processing, stacking skills that just really don't apply to deep space astrophotography. And although some of the algorithms are similar, like with stacking and drizzling, really it's a different kind of approach to astrophotography in general. People spend their whole lives just focusing on planetary or deep space and ignoring planetary altogether. That's no fun, I wanna do both of them. And I know you do too. Also planetary is like really hands-on, you can't automate most of it. You do have to sit there and fiddle with the focus and chase the seeing and chase the orbit of the planet and the moons looking for transits and things like that. It can get really complicated really quick. It's not just like sticking a camera on a telescope towards a planet and taking a photo. It just doesn't work that way. Now, I've spent years taking photos of the planet, so I've been able to share some of my knowledge with you guys and I'll share more of that knowledge today. However, I do wanna talk about one aspect of that, which is the other thing that really bugs me about this is that my really expensive cameras, my deep space cooled high bit depth cameras, suddenly aren't good for planetary. Planetary photography requires a whole different set of camera parameters. And what makes a good deep space camera doesn't necessarily translate for planetary work. So if you wanna take a photo of Jupiter, Saturn or Mars, I'm gonna give you some tips on the technical background for what makes a good planetary camera and what's gonna be the best camera for you. So stick around for that and in amongst the battery died, but you know, if there's one thing I've learnt at being an astronomer, being an astrophotographer, is patience. I have the patience of a Zen master. You know what I'm talking about because you do it too. As I was saying, in this video, I will get eyes on Jupiter, hopefully, and I will test out a new planetary camera for myself because I've been on the same camera for years because it just worked. But surely there are better cameras around these days. So let's do some hands-on experiments and see if we can figure this out. My name is Dylan O'Donnell and you're watching Star Stuff. Okay, we want to take a photo of a planet, uh, but we don't have a space agency or an orbiter that orbits around the planet. We have a backyard telescope. Where do we start? Well, Jupiter is at opposition right now, which means it's 49, let's say 50 arc seconds across end to end. And here's my telescope, the Celestron 11 inch Edge HD. Uh, and I can see that the resolving limit, uh, whether we calculate Dawes or Rayleigh, is about half an arc second. So extrapolating that out to the Jupiter image, uh, that means it's about 100 by 100, right? That's the maximum amount of detail I'm gonna get out of this telescope. No matter the eyepiece, no matter the camera, as long as it's good seeing, I should be able to get good detail on any features up to that half an arc second limit. But let's test that theory. It's easy enough to just get a you know big version of Jupiter from Hubble or JWST and downscale it to what we just worked out, 100 by 100 for my particular setup. So that should give a good approximation of the maximum possible detail I should be able to get from the telescope. And would you look at that? It's pretty bang spot on to what I get on a really good night of seeing. It's uh, one for one, apart from the fact that mine looks a little bit softer. That's because the one on the left, the simulated view, is the perfect sort of sampling because I've just taken a high resolution image and made it smaller. The one on the right is oversampled, so I've got extra pixels with no extra detail and no extra information, but it gives me a smoother result. Mm. What's this? So I used a planet and worked backwards, which I think is pretty cool and it illustrates the point I'm trying to make about the maximum level of detail you can get out of your planetary shots and it's good to know that. But how do you know that? 
Well, I've done all the hard work for you. If you go to the show sponsor Bintel, that's www.bintel.com.au, I've developed a calculator where you can actually simulate cameras and your telescope combination. It will show you the maximum resolving limit and you can see whether your images are undersampled or oversampled. For deep space astrophotography, you want to be in the sweet spot, but for planetary photography, it doesn't matter, you can actually be oversampled. In fact, it's better to be oversampled, but not too much. There is a point where those pixels are not doing anything at all. Hopefully when this video goes up, the new Bintel site's rolled out and you'll be able to see your telescope simulation by simply looking for the telescope on the Bintel website and clicking the simulate link. This also works for cameras as well. Don't worry, if they don't stock what you're currently using, you can actually enter in the details of any particular telescope or any camera combination, and it will still give you the results that you need. The idea of this calculator is not to simulate every object in the universe. It's to give you a good idea of how telescopes and cameras interact and give you a great idea of the sampling so that when you go to buy your next camera, you can make sure it's gonna work with your stuff. I've just bought a new camera from Bintel with my own hard-earned money. And I'm gonna use that camera now to see if it's a good fit for my particular setup. I think it is because I use the calculator. shit bags and uh, I think it looks good. I think it adds like a kind of ambiance. Okay, let's go back to the theoretical limit of Jupiter in this example. Let's imagine that there's a monolith, a piece of detail, which is exactly half an arc second, the limit of my particular camera telescope situation. So if the monolith is sitting there at an apparent 0.5 arc second patch of sky, it'll darken one pixel on our perfectly sampled theoretical camera. Now, if we grab a camera with smaller pixels that can actually oversample the image, the monolith will now take up four pixels because we've halved the size of the pixel. This is called critical sampling. And this is the actual goal of the 5X rule. What is the 5X rule? So what is the ideal sampling or oversampling for your telescope? Uh, planetary photographers have something called the 5X rule. I love rules, rules are simple. Uh, I can count to five, so that's good, right? Uh, the 5X rule is kind of this shorthand rule. I'll show you how it works, but I think the rule is kind of wrong. Okay, the 5X rule goes something like this. You get your pixel size and you times that by five. In this case, it's four micrometers, which equals 20, but 21, it's actually F20. So F20 is the target that you want for your telescope. Now I'm using a C11, which is F10. So in order to get my F10 to F20, I want to add a Barlow, maybe a two times Barlow, which would then equal F20. That's the 5X rule. However, the 5X rule is wrong. Astrophotographers swear by the 7X rule. So seven times the four micromillimeter pixels on the QHY 200 in this example would actually equal F28. So if I used a 2.5X Barlow or PowerMate, I would get F25, which is pretty close to that F28. But why? What the hell for? What does this all even mean? Uh, the, I feel like this is just shorthand for the actual issue at hand, which is sampling. And because we're using pixels, obviously this is all about sampling. We want the sampling to be exactly four times the maximum limit of your scope. So if our theoretical monolith is the maximum possible detail you can get on your camera, we want that monolith to take up a size of four pixels. It should actually be called the 4X rule and it shouldn't be using F ratio at all. We should just look straight to the pixels and the maximum resolution of your telescope. And this is the goal. After getting this confusing fact wrong, I've added the 5X and the 7X rule to the Bintel calculator anyway, so you get a green tick to show you which one of these rules you're hitting with your particular sampling. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing 
is the sampling and the oversampling should be four times to reach that critical sampling. So I've added a multiplier in the oversampling results on the calculator so you can see when you hit that 4x mark. That's the right rule. And after talking to some astrophotographers about planetary and getting the best results, they all agree that 7x is the one that gets them the best results. And this makes sense because the 7x rule is actually the one that gets you to the 4x oversampling. So we can keep using the 7x, 5x rule, but use the 7x version. And you can throw all of that away and just use a calculator and make sure you're four times oversampled. Now, I wish I had a money shot to show you at the end of this video, but I've been using the QHY200M and I did get first light in between the clouds and the rain and man, was I pleased. I was able to image Saturn and Jupiter in 16-bit mode, which is actually 12-bit, but it did it at 100 frames per second and it doesn't drop frames, which is something my last planetary camera has been doing. And what's more, I left this camera accidentally plugged in and running for a week. So it was shooting 100 frames a second for a week, shooting nothing, shooting the wall, but it must have taken like 60 million exposures and it was still going and it's still working fine. These industrial CMOS cameras are really a miracle of engineering. Anyway, I got some medium seeing and when I looked at Jupiter, I saw that Ganymede was just gently kissing its limbs. It was beautiful. And Saturn was looking good too. In fact, it looks a little bit sharper, I think because it was higher in the sky at the time. So I'm really excited to see what this camera can do with a night of really good seeing. Now, Bintel has these cameras in stock. Is this camera for you? Possibly, you should use the camera to work that out. There are different cameras, pixel sizes that might be better for that critical sampling that you should try and reach with your particular setup. If planetary is the goal, you want a planetary camera and a Barlow combination that gets you to that four times oversampling. Thanks for sitting through all of that while I worked that out in my head and I hope you enjoyed the calculator upgrades. My name is Dylan O'Donnell, you've been watching Star Stuff. Remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die.